swimming after listening to Dr. Joel Perman's talk. I, I was, it's just swimming. And um, I think that if I, if we just keep laboring on more and more and more information, you're just kind of like information overload. So I thought rather than do that, uh, we will kind of do like bringing together various principles, um, talking about certain issues that have come up. I might have a slightly different take that I think might be instructive or informative for you to hear. To the extent that it's helpful, great. To the extent that it's not, then forget it. Um, so with that, I called it NHA Potpourri. And uh, again, it is not very many slides. I think it's about 11 or 12. I think this is gonna be my new style. Very few slides. It makes it much less onerous preparing for a presentation when you're thinking about 10 slides versus seven. And I think on the audience end, you don't mind less slides, do you? I, I could always put in a bunch with a lot of text. So um, you remember how I started off my last slide, my, I mean my last presentation, is this whole concept of lifelong learning, right? It was my journey um, uh, in becoming, right, a plant-based physician. And I showed a picture of Dr. Stefan Esser. He is now part of my journey. Well, yesterday, one of my dreams came true. Do you remember who the inspiration behind me even going on this track is? Dr. Joel Perkin. And so yesterday, I got to look Dr. Furman in the face and thank him, give him a hug, uh, basically thank him personally for changing the direction of my life. Uh, that meant a lot. It was kind of like dream on steroids this morning when I had the chance to play with Greg Fitzgerald and Dr. Vernon, kind of X-rated, but uh, we, played, um, we played Aussie style tennis, and it was an absolute blast. Uh, they are both outstanding, amazing players, and I think it's gonna become a tradition. Shirts optional. <laughs> So it, this, is, uh, this is now yet another part of my plant-based journey. Meeting Dr. Berman in person, meeting uh, Dr. Greg Fitzgerald for the first time, uh, and learning, basically learning from all these legends around me. I wanted to start off with a huge thank you. That, that's the first thing. Um, the Dr. Or Brene Brown, she defines authenticity as this. Authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. These last few years have been a gradual process, still a long ways to go, of me letting go of who I think I'm supposed to be. And I've come to this belief that one of the greatest needs or longings in a human being is to be loved and accepted for who he or she truly is on the inside. Because so many times we sort of think about what people want us to be, who they need us to be, who they think we should be, and so because we seek their love, we become them. Uh, and I did that a lot growing up. Um, and I think we all do that a lot, even in this plant-based world. What, what does my audience need? What do I, what, what are the other people watching my presentation thinking of this? And we're, we're playing to that. And the last presentation I gave was uh, sort of life-changing for me because I just kind of let it all out. And um, I showed you an inner glimpse of myself. And I have been overwhelmed by the response from you all coming to me personally, thanking me, telling me it meant a lot to you, uh, sharing your own personal struggles with maybe depression, maybe anxiety, maybe some, some other sort of food addiction or, or something else, uh, sharing of your faith. And you basically, you, you know, I, I, let my, I put my heart out there and you all accepted it, embraced it, and, and gave me love back and it was very affirming and validating. And so I just want to say, Thank you. It means a lot to me. And I've been thinking a 
lot about this word authenticity uh, just these last few days. And one situation that it comes up a lot is social situations, right? Raise your hand if you've ever struggled with this lifestyle and social situations. <laughs> okay, great. So basically everyone. Raise your hand if you have never struggled with this lifestyle and being in social situations. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bollinghammer, of course. Dr. Bollinghammer, by the way, if you don't know it, is Vulcan. <laughs> he is really Spock in disguise. <laughs> you know, Dr. Bullhammer is absolutely amazing. He is one like no other. Um, but I've been thinking about social situations, and I had this, I mean, you can tell me if it works, but just in the last day, I had this thought on social situations and related to authenticity. So I'm just gonna, in the spirit of just kind of going with it, this is the first time I've shared this, okay? And you can tell me if it works or not. But what I've observed is that there's kind of two extremes when we look at a sort of a line and handling social. It, it doesn't matter if this is Christmas, doesn't matter if this is going out to a restaurant, doesn't matter if this is some potluck, right? This applies in every situation. There's two extremes, and then there's something in between. Now, one extreme is what I'm going to call people pleaser. All right? The people pleaser person goes to someone's house of a dear friend, and they get served some really amazing meal, and they have some sort of strategy for dealing with it. God forbid that they offend their friend and the host. So maybe they've got their little napkin under their table, and their strategy is to eat a bite, <laughs> eat another bite and then basically collect a little pile then pretend that they need to go up and get a go to the bathroom meanwhile they flush it down the toilet get a new one is the host offended no does the host it, let's pretend the host doesn't know is the host offended yeah. have they pleased the host yeah. yeah and so in their mind they have succeeded they have escaped that social situation Intact. Friendship intact. No offense. No ripples. That's the people pleaser. Or the people pleaser is the one who, I mean, this is a little less, but a little less of a jump, but they, they say, well, it, it works for me. It's probably not even right. I don't even know if there's any truth to this way of eating. It works for me, so I'm just gonna give it a try for a couple of days and see what happens. Now that seems very innocent on the outside, but is that what you really believe? No, it's not what you believe. So are you being truthful? No, and I'm gonna argue that it does something to you. That every time that you make up an excuse for the way that you are eating, it does something to you. And I think we need to stop that. Because you don't think that there's not much to it. You actually do believe there's a lot of evidence to it. And so you are not being truthful. Sure, you are not threatening them. You're not threatening their world. But you are not being truthful. And you are pandering to their world. You are people pleasing. Now let's go the other extreme. This is the my way or the highway. And we see this too. Oh my God, are you really gonna keep, put that into your mouth? Do you know that that's gonna raise your IGF-1 levels and lead to early cancer and probably an early death? How can you feed your children that? Have you not read The Pleasure Trap? Have you not seen Dr. Joel Furman's videos? Or, you know, you should be handcuffed and put to jail for what you are doing right now because you are killing people. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I am not going to touch that that you just made for me because that is going to kill me. <laughs> now, all these things that you are saying are very true, but you've gone too far. 
you have trampled upon another person's feelings, you have shown no sensitivity to their worldview, you're basically being an ass. And that has to stop. But I've seen both extremes. And I've even seen experts recommend to people that they go both in. Doesn't matter what other people think. You do what you do, that's their problem. I don't agree. I don't agree. I think that if we want to have an impact, if we want to share what we truly believe with our friends, then we have to do so, but in a sensitive way. So there is, I think, a middle ground. And you all can give me feedback, because this is literally fresh off the press. And what I'm calling it is compassionate authenticity. Compassionate authenticity. Where you never say a thing that you do not mean. Well, not never, because even I say things I don't mean sometimes, right? Like, well, I'm not perfect. But you do your best. You make an intention not to say a single sentence you do not mean. But you also make every effort that everything truthful that you say does not trample upon the other person who is with you and cause you more harm than it does good. So let's take these situations. Let's, let's take these same situations. I am so I'm so honored that you, you know, you prepared this delicious meal for me. I'm really making an effort to try to eat more plant-based. It's something that I learned about just last year, and it's having radical impact on my health. So I'm really sorry if this offends you. I am, because I know you went to a lot of work, and I probably should have let you know ahead of time. But, um, but you know, I ate before I came here. Uh, but, you know, so that side dish that you made, that looks great. If you, if you don't mind, I'm just going to have some of that. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on the beef tonight, or today, or for now. Um, you know what? If someone asks you about your diet, Oh, I've, I've been doing something, it's been working really well. There's a lot of evidence behind it, you know? And um, I'm just gonna keep, keep, keep going with it. If you're ever interested, let me know because there's lots of conferences, there's books, there's resources. But if not, that's fine too. I mean, honestly, if the other person gets pissed off and offended by that, then that is a little bit more of their issue and they have issues they need to work out. So I don't want your judge, your barometer to be, does this hurt the other person's feelings? Or are they offended? Because that shouldn't be the barometer. But the barometer is, am I being insensitive and callous? Or am I trying to be sensitive and work with them? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So compassionate authenticity. Just think in everything you say from this point on, and tell me if it works. Send me an email, drlim at truenorthhealth.com. Let me know. In every situation from now on, no more being bashful about it. No more being shy about it. You don't have to blare it out. You don't have to walk into some, hey, everyone, I'm eating plant-based. Just so you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread, and you all should be doing it. You don't have to go in like that. You can still be quiet and... Um, you know, non-confrontational, just do your thing quietly. But if asked, don't shy away. Declare your truth. Declare how excited you are by this, right? And let it be known. And just don't make it seem as if what they're doing is so awful. If they ask your honest opinion, just if someone says, honestly, really, what do you think about the way I mean? Now you've been given an invitation. If you've been given an invitation, that's different. I will honestly tell you, I will tell you honestly that I cannot think in my four years of doctoring of ever having one single major backlash from any person I have been with about the way I eat or the way they eat. Not one. And I work at, work out at CrossFit, where there are people eating along the lines of Dr. Sean Baker. I've been to holiday parties where there are families that have prepared nice, amazing stuff. I have not had one single time where someone's told me that they, I mean, that I was disinvited or they were extremely offended. And I think it's because of this idea of compassionate authenticity. So, 
I think we're talking enough about authenticity. I just encourage you to try that balance. Be truthful to your own true goal, but be sensitive about it too. Any questions on that? So, so I'll repeat. So, um, what's your name? Renee. Renee. Renee? Yes. So Renee just shared that, she said it's ironic that this is coming up now, because she spoke with the Vitamix lady, and the Vitamix lady shared that someone told her to her face that she really needs to be doing this program because, because of her weight, um, and that it, of course, was very hurtful. And that's kind of what I mean, right? You all are just, I mean, I already told you, you have seen the truth in these few days. You know the truth. You know what, I would say less than 99% of the world knows. I mean, you're in that 1% that knows. But don't be smug about it. Don't be arrogant. And don't push it onto other people when they haven't asked for it. You can share it openly. You heard me. Last time, share openly about my faith. But I hope I'm not ramrodding it down you. I just shared openly. I was being authentic to myself. We live in a country that has diversity of opinion, religion, uh, sexuality, all sorts of things. I was sharing of my own. But there's a difference between that and me sort of preaching and proselytizing. So do not proselytize. Do not preach. But share. And share authentically. Okay. <clears throat> G-bomb follow-up. <laughs> this is intense. So uh, that lecture was intense. That doctor. Is Dr. Perman in here? He had a picture. Then I can be out and on. No. Um, so that G-bombs. I mean. That was an intense lecture. I was taking notes. The first first lecture, I got out my recorder. I mean, I was just like, feed me, feed me with this brain of yours and all these studies and this information and all of that. But at the same time, and let's be honest, raise your hand at all if you were, you know, kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> okay, so a lot of you were overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. I don't cook my kale and mushrooms and slurry and all of that in the way that he does. And uh, I certainly eat more starch than Dr. Furman. I mean, I'm the medical director of the McDougal program. <laughs> uh, so, we need to wrestle with this. I don't know where this is going, but we gotta just wrestle with this. All right, so let's wrestle. So tea bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, and dairy seeds. Thank you. One hundred percent agreement that these are absolutely high andy, nutrient density, top of the line, live past a hundred, Superman. I mean, the, that, that's why at, you know at his age. I mean, he's a beast on the tennis court. He's just, I was just like, you know? I mean, he's fast, he's strong. And that's because of his G-bombs, all right? But what do you do if you're not eating as much G-bombs as Dr. Furman? What do you do with that? What if you like your sweet potato? What if you like your brown rice? Jeez, I, I, I love white potato. That was behind. Do you see where that was on the question? <laughs> that wasn't lost on a lot of us, right? <laughs> Love my white potato with that Dijon mustard. Oh, so good. What do I do with that? Well, here's what I do with it. Remember Jeff Novick, yoga? So, I have basically come to adopt the Jeff Novick approach. The 50-50 plate. And I want to at least share this with you. 
I don't know if I'm ever going to be in my life, at a point in my life where 95% of what I eat is a G-bomb. I just, I don't think I am. And I'm okay with that. But I do think a nice, reasonable, realistic level, for those of you who are not Superman and Superwoman, is to go for a 50-50 plate. Which basically means, hey, start off with a soup and salad. By just starting off with a soup and salad, you know you're getting lots of vegetables, lots of greens, lots of beans, right? So start with a soup and salad. And then when you look at your plate, 50% of it is vegetables. And 50% of it is start some combination of starch and greens. Water is your drink. That small, subtle thing, to me, makes all the difference. And so I am not contradicting or have anything contrary to G-bombs whatsoever. In fact, in a way, I'm supporting it. But I guess what I wanted to make sure is that for those of you who say are eating a 50-50 plate or you're eating a zero plate and you're deciding whether to embark on this, I don't know that 100% or even 90% or that level of G-bombs is quintessential and absolutely necessary. It may be absolutely necessary to live the absolute longest that your possible lifespan can, but maybe that's not the most important thing to you. If I, if by a 50-50 plate, I can live to 99, and then by a 100% plate, I can live to 100 and 100, I think I might choose the 50-50 plate, and I think that's reasonable. So I just wanted to inject that, yeah. Yes. So what do we do with the nuts and seeds? So the I, combination of nuts and seeds with, you know, a starchy vegetable, right. it's where it's problematic. Yeah, so the combination of nuts and seeds. So let's clarify. So, wow, I actually can, can I feel empowered to speak this because I'm the medical director of the Medjugorje program. <laughs> so let's clarify nuts and seeds. Dr. Medjugorje does not forbid nuts and seeds. We serve nuts and seeds. There are nuts and seeds at the, the, the Medjugorje program. But here is his concern. They are one of the most calorically dense foods there are. And many people do not limit their nut and seed intake to one to two ounces. They do what my dad does. My dad goes to Costco. I don't know if he's I think he's better about it now. I don't think he still does it because I've used this example so much he's getting tired of me talking about it. <laughs> but he goes to Costco and he gets those big Kirkland brand of pistachios or I don't know, whatever, salted almonds, mixed nuts. Actually, my mother-in-law has one as we speak right now, but she doesn't do what my dad does. And then he'll sit down in front of the television with the bin. <laughs> He does not take out a bowl, a little bowl, and pour the nuts and seeds into it, and take that little bowl with him, this dainty little bowl of one ounce of nuts and seeds. No, he takes the whole thing. He does not eat one ounce of nuts and seeds. He probably, before, pre-plant-based pre era, he probably ate like eight ounces of nuts and seeds after dinner. My dad is probably a BMI of about 27, 28. Uh, so he's overweight. Yeah. And even since going plant-based, he has lost. But he is still overweight. You know why? Because of the salt, oil, sugar, nut seeds, things like that. And he's working on it. He came to True North and Water Basket for a while, and that helped. It cleaned his palate for about two weeks. <laughs> Remember, resilience. You don't fail until you give up. He has not given up yet. And overall, he's very healthy. My dad, my mom, I mean, I'm so thankful for this. They are 71 years old. My dad, yeah, 71-ish. And uh, no medications. Enjoying life. They are tracing across Europe right now as we speak with my older brother. I mean, talk about a blessing to have your older parents, no medications, super healthy. I mean. Yes, I, I, I wish I mean I wish they could eat even cleaner and get to that BMI of less than 23. By the way, that is a very good uh, landmark. Unless you are a bodybuilder, you should aim for a BMI of less than 23. If you look at every single speaker, yeah, 
right? I can't think. Every single speaker that you have heard this weekend, BMI of less than 23. Okay, I think mine is like 21 point. I'm 5'8", I'm 142 pounds. I'm the low, I weigh less than I did in high school. In high school, I was in the 150s with a size 33 waist. Since going plant-based, I am 142, range between 140 to 145, and I have a size 29 waist. And that's just since going plant-based. So, and where is it? Someone, sir, right? What's your name? Mark. Mark. How big was my plate of food yesterday? Huge. <laughs> Monster plate of food, right? I'm not, I mean, I don't mess around. I eat huge, huge amounts of food. And it's just like Furman and everyone said, if you eat huge amounts of food and your body just knows what to do with it when you're putting the right fuel into your system. I was just gonna say, I think, I think I've rectified it in my head, you know, considering what Esselstyn has to recommend as well. Um, if you cannot control your consumption and limit it to one to three ounces, yes. if you cannot, then you do what Esselstyn recommends and put a tablespoon of flaxseed and call it a day. Yes, what's your name? Aaron. Aaron, so Aaron said the principle that is gonna come up on another slide if I get, get to it. But um, too much to talk about. But basically, like, what she's, she's, she's grappling with it. This is good. I want us to grapple. Let's get real, let's grapple. Let's, let, let, we, we gotta make this into reality, right? That's what I said, I said we can have 30 days of the best lectures and all. If we don't turn this into what we are going to do on a daily basis, it means jack, right? it means nothing. So we've gotta grapple with it and figure out how to take this amazing information that we have been fed and turn it into actual behavioral change. And so what Aaron, right? What Aaron said is basically that if, if you can't do one to three ounces, then you gotta do what like Esselstyn talks about and maybe put like sprinkle some flaxseed. And, I, and I'm gonna get to that idea of if you can't do X, Y, Z, yeah. it's gonna come up. I saw a hand. Yes, Yes, I um, uh, used to weigh 252 pounds, and um, I'm an emotional eater. Um, and so late October of 2015, I did start Dr. Furman's plan. I became a nutritarian. And, um, and I do follow the, you know, the one ounce a day, sometimes two ounces. Sure. Um, and my saving grace is the beans. That's my meat replacement. Um, I've had white potatoes and white rice together total maybe five times. Wow. I don't eat yeah. uh, those, you know, um, but I'm happy with the beans and, um, and That's I'm how it's to limit, you know, I mean, it is possible. Yeah, and what's your name? Sandra. Sandra, and 252? Yes, and, and I'm at 132 now. Awesome. Ooh. How long ago was that? I, I start, well, I was uh, 252 in 2012, yeah. and then I gave up soft drinks just on a whim. I gave up soft drinks, and I lost 25 without doing anything else. So I started wow. as a nutritarian at about 227 in October of 2015. Wow. So Sandra started, I mean, she's, she's lost over 100 pounds. Um, and what she shared is that the nutritarian has really worked well for her. She really limits white rice and white potatoes to three, four times a year and beans are her saving grace. So I, I, this is a perfect example of someone who has adopted the nutritarian, it's working for her. And I'm gonna argue every one of us is nutritarian, we're just it to certain different degrees, okay? And I just wanna make sure that the people that are there at 50 degrees, but are otherwise 100% whole food plant-based, do not leave here feeling like a failure, because that would be, to me, a travesty. And if they're lying up at night worried about how to make that soup, then I think we've, we've done the wrong message. Because that soup, you know, you know what I did with that soup? I want to make that soup. That soup sounds great. But guess where that soup is for me right now? It's at the top of the pyramid. All right? You've got to get your basics right. All right? If you're getting kale broccoli, I don't care how it's cooked. Raw, soup. Like, you're already doing a lot of good. Now, as we get further and further and further up, then we start really looking at like optimizing the absorption, this, that. But I just want to make sure you get the basics first. It's kind of like how I feel about intermittent fasting. I have some people talk to me about intermittent fasting, and then when they're not fasting, they're eating bacon, eggs, and processed food. So why, why do I want to devote any of their willpower 
because willpower is a limited resource. Do not think that you have unlimited willpower to devote to all your various goals and endeavors. You do not. So I do not want to use up their willpower at this point on intermittent fasting. I want to use it up getting a nutritarian, whole food, plant-based, starch of war, uh, NHA, Esselstyn diet right in general. And then when they really got that down, then we can talk about things like intermittent fasting and you know all the various subtle ways you can cook foods for certain times to optimize the absorption and bioavailability. But to me, that is a top of the pyramid. Small point I haven't heard covered. Drink the water with the meal or after the meal? I, with that, I think that sort of basically whatever you desire. I don't think Either it's okay. I agree. Um, so that's that's uh, what I wanted to say about this. Um, Wanda, what time do I finish? I don't know what time you started. I started at um, I started at four. Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay, four forty-five. All right. I need a, I need a time, boy. What's that? Oh, fruit. Uh, when you eat fruit, I mean, you know, I talked with Jeff Novick about this. All these sort of food combining studies, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't show anything. So if you want to eat your fruit first and then eat your stuff, or you want to eat one bite of savory and then one bite of fruit, one bite of savory, one bite of fruit, or like kind of what makes sense to me, eat your fruit after dinner because it's like the equivalent of dessert. I think that's fine. Um, okay, chocolate cake. Now, you all heard uh, Dr. Stefan Esser's analogy to the chocolate cake. And um, I think there's a lot to this, right? We, we don't want to moralize food. Like, oh, that's an evil food. Well, this is, a, this is an angelic food, you know? And I completely agree with that. Because once you moralize, then you feel all sorts of guilt and it brings up all sorts of issues. Whereas if you just sort of take the stance of, I don't eat that food, or I, this is my food. I think it, it does make it easy. But I guess what I wanted to bring up is, I, I, Dr. Esser, is a, is, he's superhuman in my mind, because I'll tell you that if I saw this piece of chocolate cake, and let's just pretend it's vegan, right? <laughs> this vegan chocolate cake, and it was beautifully decorated, and, I, and it smelled delightful, I'm gonna wanna buy it. I'm gonna wanna eat a bite. And you know what? I will. <laughs> but, okay, so, there's, again, let's grapple. Because have you all heard this? Have you, have, have, raise your hand if you've heard this. Moderation is not an option. I, I, I believe Dr. McDougall is the one who came up with this. They've heard it so much now, but I, I always attribute it to Dr. McDougall. If anyone knows that someone else who should be attributed to, please let me know. I'm a big believer, by the way, in giving credit where credit is due. Um, so moderation is not enough. It's why when I give my caloric density, the first slide I have is a big picture of Jeff Nobi. He's the one that taught me about caloric density. So moderation is not an option. This is Dr. McDougall's going crazy. This is the phrase of a lot of plant-based experts out there. And the idea here is that it's a slippery slope. If you have one bite of this cake, 10 minutes later, not just this piece, but the entire cake is gone. <laughs> if you have one handful of popcorn from, I don't know, your nephew's popcorn at the movie theater, 10 minutes later, you've stolen the box of popcorn and eaten the whole thing yourself, and he's crying. <laughs> you know, if you have one bite of chicken or something, before you know it, you're eating a, grabbing a chicken and you're eating it. Like, it's a slippery slope that, that we, we lack control when it comes to these addictions or urges. I agree, but with qualification. And in my mind, it depends. And this is, again, where I risk, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm controversial in this respect, but this is my authentic self, so I've got to speak my authentic self. Cards fall as they may. 
I think it depends. I think it's paternalistic to say that for every single person out there, you can never have another bite of this, 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 this again, because if you do, you're not going to live to this age and you're going to you know, go down a slippery slope. And so I really think that we need to bring in a piece of wisdom from somewhere else. This Greek aphorism, know thyself. You've got to know yourself. If someone, if Wanda came to me right now and said, wow, the hotel made this piece of dark chocolate just for you because they appreciate you coming here and speaking, but you need to know, Dr. Or you need to know Anthony that it's got some sugar in it. I'm going to waffle. I'm going to eat that dark chocolate. But you know what? After I eat that dark chocolate, do you think I'm going to be thinking about chocolate the whole day? No, I'm not. I am not. Dark chocolate is not a trigger. I can enjoy a piece of dark chocolate. I can eat it. I can savor it. And then I can leave it at that. And I will have fond memories of that dark chocolate. It, it will have enriched my life overall. And I'm willing to take the hit of that little bit of sugar that I got into my system. Not everyone in here could do that. And if you can't, guess what? That's OK. But then, but then own it. Don't eat that dark chocolate. Because you just say, you know, the last time I had a piece of dark chocolate and I thought it was OK, guess what? I was at the store buying bars of dark chocolate and eating them in my car in quiet. I'm going to tell that person, moderation is not an option. You should not be having it. When I graduated from residency, my friend Jimmy Wu, he gave me the first three seasons to a DVD series called Game of Thrones. Raise your hand if you've heard of Game of Thrones. Okay, a lot of you. Wow. Raise your hand if you've watched some of it. Okay, so a lot of years. I had heard so much about Game of Thrones. Like, this was the series to watch. And I was, he, he basically said, he literally said, hey, Anthony, you've earned it. You finished residency. Like, knock yourself out. And that night, that very night, I popped in the first one. Man, that first one is crazy. <coughs> Yeah, and, I mean, I won't even give it away. I don't like to give things away. But it was crazy. But it, it had the hook. It had everything that a good drama series has. And I remember literally saying in my mind, this is going nowhere good. <laughs> because I had learned. You remember uh, Kevin Spacey um, came uh, House of Cards? Oh, yeah. I hadn't learned that lesson maybe the last the year before that, where I thought I could watch the first one, and about six hours later at 4 or 5 a.m., I was still watching. And this was on the day that I had to work the next day. Guess what, folks? I was addicted. I'm not proud to admit it. I wish it wasn't so. I wish that I could have just watched that first episode of House of Cards, and then, like a good little boy, gone to bed, and then one week later on a Friday night, say, I get to watch my second episode of House of Cards. And then blah, 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 so that over 13 weeks, I would watch 13 episodes. That would be ideal, but guess what, folks? I watched it all in one night, the entire first season in one night. And so I had learned that lesson that I completely lack self-control when it comes to television. And so what I have had to do is just own up to that. I have not turned my television on once in the entire three days here. I don't plan on it. Because I've seen, because, because this is too important to me. I don't want to be tired for this. I don't want to be second rate for this. I want to be at my best. And I don't want to lose out on that by watching some crappy television which I'm addicted to. So I have to own up to that. And for me, moderation is not an option when it comes to television. But I'm not ashamed of it. I just own up to it. Maybe one day, maybe, maybe, maybe in certain circumstances I can watch it. But right now, or in certain situations, I can. I mean, I do watch television, but it's very defined. I watch the Warriors playoff series from the fourth quarter on. <laughs> I mean, I have all sorts of rules around it. 
And I need that. I need that structure. Many of you are like, oh my gosh, what? I can watch that and it's not fun. I mean, so, so that's not your issue. But this kind of goes back to my theme earlier in the last one. We're all screwed up in our own way, so just own up to it and stop, like, stop pretending that you don't have that, okay? Stop, if you've binged on sugar multiple times, stop pretending that you can have a little bit of sugar and not binge. Maybe you can retry that experiment when you reach your ideal body weight. And I'm all about experiments. I love experiments. Because to me, if you're not sure whether moderation is an option or not, I'm open to it, but let's be scientific about it, okay? Let's see, can you have that little bit of meat? Or can you have that little bit of sugar? Or can you have that little bit of whatever without it triggering some negative cascade that overall compromises your health? And if not, then you learn. So that's my sort of take on the whole moderation is not enough. Oh, 10 minutes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did you change your topic? Are you going to talk about food soda? Yes. Oh, you are? Yeah, so at the beginning I shared that, um, you know, gosh, you've gotten the blue zones. I mean, when you see what the blue zones are, it's not it's going to basically be uh, all the things we talked about. So instead what I wanted to do is synthesize and build upon things that have come up over the course of this uh, conference. Now, uh, Dr. Esser, health plan follow-up. And for the sake of time, um, raise your hand if you did this exercise. Okay, so pretty good. I mean, it's tell them that about like 30% did the, the health plan exercise. Um, I just want to show you, I think this is really important, and I just want to show you a uh, re review so that you can take that health plan and expand upon it. So remember, it's smart goals, specific. This is one of the things that is the most common thing I see when people make goals. It's not specific enough, and you're going to see an example of that. Measurable. This should be measurable so that any outside observer could basically say, did this person succeed or not? If I say, I want to exercise more, that sounds like a reasonable goal. I want to exercise more. Is that something measurable? Not really. I mean, what does more mean if I like, okay, I just exercise more. I've done my exercise for the day. That took calories and strength to do my legs like that. You know, but that, so what do we mean by more? You need to be specific, you need to be, have it measurable, all right? Is that 50 minutes, is it 20 minutes? What's your exact goal? Action-oriented. There's a big difference between saying my goal is I'm gonna be 150 pounds by December versus I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. We much prefer action-oriented things versus outcomes. The outcome will be the logical outflow of the habits or the processes. Does that make sense? So there's a big difference between, you know, uh, a weight versus the habits as your goal that are gonna get you to that weight, all right? Uh, realistic, don't aim for the moon, like start off small and build on confidence. And then time bound, actually set a deadline by which point you want to achieve that. So this first one is, one that uh, someone here gave me, and uh, she gave me permission to share it. Uh, I am going to walk every day for at least one half hour. I am going to take a pickleball and bowl. I am going to go to bed at an earlier hour. I am giving up dark chocolate as it is addicted to me. And I guess the big one, and these are great. These are all going to take her in the right direction. Here's just some things I'll point out. Uh, I am going to go to bed at an earlier hour. What does this lack? Specificity, right? And, and sort of a deadline. So just kind of just stream of consciousness. Um, five out of seven days a week, I commit to being in bed with lights out by 10.30 p.m. By <coughs> August, 30, August 30th of 2018. I put that deadline because then it gives her a chance to work up. I would, my first question to her would be, how many days currently per week are you doing that? And she will say, one. I say, okay, I think it's going to be a stretch if you want to go from one to next week being at five. That's going to be too, too ambitious. So let's say August is your deadline of when you're doing that. So let's just build on one day every week. So next week, make your goal two days out of the week, then three days, then four days, then five days, so that by July, or end of July, 
you were at five days and now you're in maintenance mode. Notice, did I say seven out of seven days? No, why not? Realistic, right? If she does seven out of seven days, hallelujah, right? I mean, outstanding. But if she does five out of seven, then great. So you, you leave room so that you establish your bare floor that what you want to hit. And then if you surpass it, then great. When I've done goals, I've actually done this. I've done like bare minimum, good, awesome. So that I, 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 my goal is at least to get the bare minimum. Um, I'm going to take up pickleball and golf. Again, I would ask for specificity. So take up is so narrow. So instead it would be like, um, I commit two days a week for a minimum of one hour to trying out the new sports of pickleball and golf. Right? Now, any single person in this room could be her accountability partner because there's something measurable. How many times this week did you go out? Zero or one. Like, okay, so you're making movement in the right direction, but don't forget, you committed to two times. All right, you said for an hour each time. All right, so that's that's one example. This one is very different, and I wanted to share it. Um, and Brandy is, is is kind and generous enough to allow me to share it and, and, uh, with all of you. So her, she started off with kind of a, what I call like a life vision, in a way, what she wants her life to be about. And she, she started off with a, a verse from the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have in God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And that to her is her inspirational sort of line. You know, and sometimes for some people they call it like a life verse. You know, so whatever your background or religion, do you have a life verse? Do you have some quote? that basically encapsulate what you want your life to stand for. It looks like that's what Randy has done. I love it. It's sort of this high level thing that guides your life. When you're in doubt, you just go back to that verse, something inspirational. I would encourage her to like put it on a huge poster board and around her house because it would be a visual reminder. And then what she's done is she's done a kind of a general thing about what she wants her health plan to be. Be grateful, so gratitude. Whole food plant based. Eat only between 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sleep, movement, pray, study, meditate, journal, give an attempt, be kind, no, no, salt, sugar, oil, caffeine, alcohol, judging. So, you know, there's a lot to work with here, but I think what she's done is laid out general principles that are important to her. And so, I think that's great. It's good. To, I have something called a life mission statement. It's two pages, but it's one page. It's what I want my entire life to stand for. It's not very specific at all. It's very general. Then you have very specific, smart but there's a difference. One is kind of an overall sort of like book guide, blueprint, and then the other gets down to brass tacks and what are the specifics. And there's roles for both. So I wanted to see you, wanted to show you examples of both. Um, so take what you did and work with, and work that smart into it. Okay? Um, I think that was a very helpful thing that Dr. Dresser started for us. All right, in one minute, we're going to do the blueprint. So the blue zones are areas around the world that have a high percentage of centenarians, right? People living past the age of 100. And Dan Buechner uh, distilled it down to what he called nine power principles, or the nine things that they all shared in common. And the reason this is quick is because all we've done this weekend is talk about them. Movement, right? My, my keys with movement are consistency and sort of balance between cardiovascular resistance training, uh, balance, and flexibility. Ikigai is life meaning. Why do you wake up in the morning? Are you excited? That gets back to the passion that we heard with the great Dr. Isabeau. All right, live your life with passion. If you haven't found it, keep looking. Don't just give up on it. Find out what that thing is that gets you fired up. Stress reduction, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. You've gotten a lot of talk about how to reduce stress this weekend. Plant slant, preaching to the choir here. But all of them ate. 90% of their calories from plants, right? How to hajibu, I already talked about this. Don't eat till you're stuck, eat until you're satiated, right? This one's the controversial one. I didn't want to put it up, but I put it up because I'm being honest about what he has as his power principle. Alcohol was one of the things that was shared by these blue zones. So where am I at with this? If you don't drink, please don't start. 
If you drink in excess of two drinks if you're a man or one drink if you're a woman, then please cut down. And if you're at two drinks if you're a man and one drink if you're a woman, for a woman, take in mind what Dr. Esser said about alcohol. Uh, the Esser, yeah, and the fact that any amount can increase your risk of cancer. That's where I'm at with that. The alcohol in these blue zones, it served in many ways a social function, right? So, um, you know, it is what it is. Two or one per day, per week, per month? Oh, so the official is one per day if you're a woman, and two per day if you're a man, and you cannot average. So you can't go Monday through Friday and not drink, and then have five drinks on Friday, and 14 drinks you know, on, 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 on if you're a male. It doesn't work that way. You're gonna overwhelm your liver and you're gonna lead to early liver cancer and cirrhosis. So do not average, all right? And like I said, really pay close attention to what you heard about alcohol. This is just what Cam Newton wrote in the blue zone. Family, family first. You know, it's great to have habits and rituals. Uh, this is one of the rituals I have with my kids. I have a six-year-old daughter, Julia, and a ten-year-old daughter, a ten-year-old son, Joshua. Every year since the age of two, I have taken Joshua on a road trip. And it's, the rules of the road trip are three. Number one, I can't bring any work or do any work. Number two, no one else is invited besides me and my son or my daughter. Uh, number three, it has to be a minimum of one night. That's it. So we did a road trip with Julia. This one is in Oakland, and I live in Santa Rosa. That's like an hour away. It doesn't matter the place. It just matters that I'm spending time with her, 100% devoted to her with no work and no one else around. And let me tell you, it's been one of the best things I have ever done in my entire life. I hope that when I'm 80 and they're 50, that we're still doing this tradition. So I, this was mine with Julia, and this was mine uh, recently with Joshua. I'm getting excited just thinking about you know, where the next one's gonna be. The other tradition and ritual that we started recently is as a family, we go on RV trips. The RV, if you want to eat plant-based on the road, is one of the best ways to do it, okay? So uh, we are going to Oregon this year. So to end, uh, spirituality, out of 262 centenarians that Dr. Dan Buechner interviewed, all but five of them had some form of spirituality. Ancestor worship in, in, in Okinawa, Japan, uh, Seventh day Adventists in Lola Linda, um, Catholicism in Italy, right? Uh, so it wasn't so much the form of spirituality, it was just the idea of spirituality, something bigger and greater than ourselves. And then last, I wanted to end on this community. Because what you have witnessed these three days is healthy community on steroids. I mean, have you all been feeling it? Like, there's just been so much positive energy, so many lovely interactions, so many sort of insights and personal growth. This is what community could be and could feel like. And the thing that struck me most about what Gail Buechner said is that the people in these blue zones were not planning how to live a healthy life. It just happened. Their environment, their community nudged them in the direction of health. So we need to figure out how we create more of this, and how, and for you all to think how you can create more of this in your own community. Take home points, life is a journey, not a destination. Aim to live a more authentic life, please. Do your best. Do not let perfection be the enemy of good. Think about the Novik 50-50 play method. Know thyself, right? In some cases, moderation is not an option. I completely agree with that. But in some cases, dare I say it, Possibly, maybe a little bit is okay, and you have to know yourself. Be intentional about goal setting. Think about the SMART goals, and then also think about Randy's idea of just kind of huge life mission statements or life verses that really guide your philosophy in your life. And then, you know, if there's one word that characterizes the blue zone, it's just balance, right? They have this balance amongst these nine power principles. Live a balanced blue zone lifestyle that incorporates the nine power principles. I just want to say that it has been a true honor and a privilege. I will never, ever in my life forget this conference and what transpired during it, and I will feel forever indebted uh, and grateful to all of you. Thank you.